Hi, I'm Leah, and I'm with Brad Zalas, a cross-generational expert, consultant, and author. Hi, Brad. How are you? Very good, Leah. Thank you. So, Brad, millennials. Let's talk a little bit about millennials. I know you're the expert. So, tell me, what got you started with millennials? It actually goes back to the Mm mid-90s. I started a very small um, advertising and uh, freelance agency. We did we did a lot of print campaigns for corporations and for the first year we're doing design work and we're struggling right. and we're in a tiny room like it, it's the classic entrepreneur story we're in a 9 by 12 office and we have two Mac 2 CI computers. Oh my. Yeah and so we're sitting there and we had some really great clients like American Express and Banco Popular wow. but it wasn't enough to pay the rent. Right. Uh, or at least pay us salaries. We struggled that first year. And one day my uh, business partner, Doug Cleek, comes bursting in the office. He's all excited. And he goes, we need to become an internet company. And I'm savvy, or at least I thought I was. I said, what the heck's the internet? <laughs> and, uh, and most people back then, they really did not know what the internet was. Right. It was a uh, gray background, static pages. Mm-hmm. A lot of people just thought it was email. And so that first couple of months we got a laptop and we started showing people the work we were doing and they had no idea what this was. So you're one of the internet pioneers. Yes I am. I'm officially an internet pioneer. Wow. (laughs) 1.0. And uh, all of a sudden uh, we had one executive much older, much wiser and he stood up and he said could you guys create a CD-ROM hybrid that could launch a proprietary browser that would take us to a password protected section of our website? Could you guys do that? You know, for three months, nobody knew what we were doing and all of a sudden this guy's talking the language. And I was like, yes, we can do that. So we built uh, JP Morgan's uh, Chase CD-ROM hybrid for 1996, their annual report. And that's a great story unto itself because all of a sudden, you know, I had 60 employees, we did an IPO uh, wow. We were one of the very first to go uh, public on NASDAQ. But what happened is I had this brand new workforce. Mm-hmm. And I'm a baby boomer. Right. And uh, I'm a cusp boomer. If you don't know what the difference between the cusp boomer and a regular boomer is, is this. I have a stepbrother that was 12 years older than me, and he was worried about Vietnam. Right. When I got to about the same age as a cusp boomer, I was worried about getting it home in time to see the ABC after school special. <laughs> Okay, so there's a very big difference in how we were raised, but somehow we got lumped in to this box called Baby Boomer. Right. Well, at the time, we weren't talking about generational issues uh, in the 90s, uh, mid to late 90s, but something was happening. Mm -hmm. And I started to notice that I had a workforce that was telling me off. They were kind of, uh, they wanted to push against all the rules. And I thought at first it was because maybe they all had master's degrees or they were working with technology or or something like that. I just did not know. I was tearing my hair out. Uh, And then when I resigned and I stepped down from the board of directors, it took me a few years, but I started doing the research and I started to realize, oh my goodness, (laughs) this is the first wave of the digital native that came along. Uh, And all of a sudden I was working with Generation X and Generation Y, and that really became the platform for the work that I do today. My entire book, Liquid Leadership, is based on managing and running this workforce in the 21st century, and I explain why millennials act the way they do. I'm the only person doing it. (laughs) Yes, I know. And um, Brad, tell us why they're getting stereotyped, because you and I both work with millennials, and they're fabulous, but they're getting a bad rap. Can you share? I love working with millennials, and the first thing that people say is, uh, you know, don't put them in boxes. And, and I'm a big believer of that I think and act more like a millennial. I always have since I was a kid. And I realized I was raised by entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. My grandfather's an entrepreneur, my mom was an entrepreneur, my dad was an entrepreneur. So I'm comfortable in that world. Well, now you have a new generation that is more entrepreneurial in their thinking, independent thinking. The real reason, and I, and I don't want anybody to do this, but uh, you, you, these are just clues. They're not boxes to shove people into. Right. So we have, we have boomers, we have Generation X, and we have millennials. All this does is give us some pattern recognition for behavior and buying patterns. And all they are are marketing terms. Mm-hmm. That's really all they are. But all of a sudden, this new generation came along and they've been raised completely differently. And What's happening is boomers are looking at them through the lens of the way we were raised. 
a lot of rules, hierarchy. You must obey me because I've been here for years. <laughs> I invented Teflon back in the 70s. And so you get these uh, guys in the C-suite. And I, I'm a former C-level executive of a publicly traded company. So I can enter the boardroom and go, guys and gals, we've got to start changing the way we do business because this next generation, it isn't just that people have changed, the way you can do business has changed. Mm -hmm. And explaining it doesn't really get it across to people. So I actually have to show them. Okay. And so what I do is, boomers were raised with this. This was the most interactive device that a baby wow. boomer could use. This I is remember a, those. Yeah, <laughs> GF Viewmaster. We had to use our creative imagination. Right. <laughs> okay. And then by 1984, we're wow. working with things like this. Mm -hmm. So do you think our brains might be much more complex? Absolutely. You know, so we can't apply the same rules simply because we've moved out of the, the industrial revolution, right. the 20th century model where you work hard, you work your way up through the ranks to the top of the pyramid, and then you get a corner office because you're older and you're wiser and all the young people are looking up to you and admiring everything you've, you've done all these years. It's not working because new generations came along with technology, different training, collaborative ways of working. They were raised completely different by their parents, first right. of all. You know, my father is the first generation born from Hungary in the United States. He didn't care about my feelings. <laughs> you know, he, he, he wanted me to get up at 5.30 <laughs> in the morning. And uh, as a matter of fact, he had this great speech that he did with me. He said, um, I'm your father. I am not your friend. And he said, when I tell you to jump, you say, how high? Now, go get your work clothes on because we got work to do. Maybe when you're 35 years of age, I might find you interesting enough to have a beer with you. Until then, let's go, buddy. Oh, I love it. And that's how we were raised. That was my Mo upbringing. Right, <laughs> most boomers were raised that way. But along came a new generation where the parents looked at them and said, hey, Billy, don't get up. It's only 10.30. I know, don't get up. Um, mommy and Daddy have a question for you. We'd like to know, um, do you think we should get a divorce, honey? What do you think? You oh, know? my God. Now, you're laughing at that. <laughs> yeah. And some people watching this are going to go, I never raised my kids that way. Maybe you did, maybe you did, right. but all of a sudden this attitude of I have to be friends with my children, I have to mentor my children, I have to be not a parent but an advisor and I'm going to drive them to all these you know, sporting events and I'm going to take them to karate classes, dance lessons, all these different things, that flattened the hierarchy in the household. Helicopter parents. Exactly. And what it did is you have a new generation, and by the way, this is not good or bad. I'm not judging this. I'm just trying to tell you we've opened up a, a Pandora's box, and what it's done is, is it's created this independent young person who really wants to face the world with a lot of different dynamics than the boomer generation. And sad to say, Gen X is right in between. They understand both sides of this. There's mm -hmm. sort of the Jan Brady of all this. But for some reason, uh, companies are ignoring Generation X, and they are primed and perfect for management right now. And they're not, they're not really looking at them. At them. They're stumbling over millennial, you know, boomers uh, are stumbling over Gen X just so they can shake hands with millennials. Why? Because millennials, as a group, when they're not happy within a company, they will all get up as a group and leave on a Friday and never tell you they're not coming back on Monday morning. Well, people don't quit jobs, Brad. They yes. quit their bosses. Exactly. We, all, we know that. How many times have you quit a job and how many times did you quit a boss? You know, I, uh, I'm i one of those... Or you never quit. <laughs> this is the sad part. I'm one of those who was the um, loyal to a fault. Oh, yeah. Dummies. You know, we, Been the, there, done that. Yeah, we, we were taught to be loyal to the company and that, would, that means you could get the raise and you could get all these things and, and that's over. Uh, yeah. Oh, they lied. They lied. <laughs> and I think millennials through osmosis, uh, they heard their parents go, don't do what we did. Right. You know, we, we were loyal to this company and they did this. And they did all these things to us. And then now the companies are shocked when uh, this new generation, I don't even want to call them millennials. They're just a new generation that's been raised very differently. Right. They will get up and leave if you don't treat them well because they see a lot of the things in the corporate structure that are kind of abusive. They weren't raised that way. They weren't raised to be yelled at. They were raised to collaborate, get the very best vision out of the product that you're creating. Um, they've been taught to hustle. 
uh, at a different level. And we're still judging them through this lens. We're, we're actually looking at millennials like this going, why aren't you doing it my way? This is getting in the way. It's like a, a set of rose colored glasses that is interfering with seeing this new generation the way they need to be seen. So Brad, how can employers fix the situation and make it more cohesive between a multi-generational employment force? Take a good look at how we were all raised. Uh, if you are, let's say, 45 years of age and older, you were taught there's this sort of pyramid of hierarchy where at 20 years of age, you enter the workforce and you, you keep your mouth shut. You sit down, you, you listen, you do all the right things. Then at the next level, at 30, you're going to be chosen maybe to go in underneath a boss. And then by 40 and 50, you're going to get management, moxie, maybe some training. Mm -hmm. And then by 60, uh, you're going to get that corner office and you're going to be asked to be on the board of directors, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that's in every baby boomer's head. What we need to do is shift that because that was based on age, time, and your skills that you accumulated and knowledge within that business sector. But today, you have a young person who's coming right out of college who's been trained on the latest technology, and they know that an app can replace an entire business sector or one of your, your, your corporate branches can be replaced with an app now. So what the criteria now for the 21st century is flatten the organization. And that means age has to be removed from the criteria. And when you form teams, the team leader is in charge of output, corporate culture, and who's on the team. Now, this isn't based on age or how much time you're in. Sometimes people will have to move from one team to the next, but it's based on the latest skill set. Are you contributing? How well are you contributing? Look at it this way. Uh, in the military, they've had to adjust mm -hmm. because of millennials. Right. Uh, so think of it as commandos in the field. Or, you know, how would you play a multi-level video game. You pick your team members according to their skill sets. Leadership is rotational within those skill sets and those teams. And whenever you accomplish a mission or a goal, you give out rewards. You know, a lot of companies are actually doing this. They're rethinking the way they run their management structure. And that is uh, companies like uh, Google. Mm -hmm. uh, Netflix actually was on the cover of uh, the Harvard Business Review. Uh, and they surprised everybody because what they did is they decided to hire differently. And that's a real key in the 21st century. You must hire differently. You can't just look at the resume. Right. You have to kind of look at it this way. Netflix did this. They believe rather than hire two mediocre employees, let's hire one winner. Somebody who's aggressive, who really wants to accomplish things, who really sees their career as something that um, they take very seriously. So you hire nothing but top players, you pay them well, but at the same time, you put them in charge of their vacation time. And this is where the study from the Harvard Business Review really made people tear their hair out all of a sudden in HR, and that is, you can take as much vacation time as you want. Now think about that for a minute. Leah, what would you do if your boss said, well, take as much time as you want, we're still gonna pay you. You'd probably be like, where am I working? Is this some right. sort of like fancy? Where is that job? Yeah, this is amazing. I want that job. So uh, Harvard Business Review, they questioned this. They, you know, if somebody wants to take three months off, they can take three months off at Netflix. And their belief is this. When you hire winners, winners almost always say, oh, you know, I can only take seven or eight days off, but I got to get back in the, into they the job. Because they love They their... love what they do. They're passionate about what they do. And they're not going to... They're not going to. They're not going to. You know, for lack of a better word, they're not going to screw the company. Right. They're going to want to contribute. So if you hire only A players like that, right. you're going to transform your workforce culture, and it it has nothing to do with well, that guy's been here for thirty years. That guy has been here for thirty years. It may be time to say, hmm, what do you want to do outside of that area, uh, and maybe move into something you're passionate about. And if we can't do that, well, we really can't support you in, in the structure. And Netflix did that. Their first bookkeeper helped them get all the way up to when they went public. Mm -hmm. And then they had a sit down meeting and they found out she couldn't contribute anymore at the level she was at because she didn't have CFO qualifications. Right. And it was both a meeting of the minds on both sides. You're right. I can't continue here anymore and be effective 
to the leadership role that I'm in. So they gave her a fantastic severance pay and she was able to leave and take her career now in a new direction. So Brad, tell us about your TED Talk. My TED Talk was the most stressful talk I've ever given in my life. And yet at the same time, it was the most rewarding. Uh, uh, and let me explain. Uh, I signed up, you know, because you pitch your idea. And uh, it turned out the place I, I wanted to submit my idea for a TED Talk, uh, I only had a half hour to submit it. So I got it in in 20 minutes. I didn't even think about it. I just came up with this great title and went boom like that. So two weeks later, uh, they said I got it in on time, by the way. I had 10 minutes to spare. And uh, on that Friday before Memorial Day, I got two great pieces of news. First, I got the TED Talk. And then the second thing I did is I was contacted by Tony Robbins' people to do a webinar for Tony Robbins. Wow. On millennials. So it, it's been kind of a roller coaster since then. Uh, but what happened with the TED Talk is, uh, as a professional speaker, you, I've spoken in front of very large audiences, but this is a very different animal because I'm not talking about corporate stuff. I'm not talking about any of that. I'm coming up with an idea I'm passionate about. And I am passionate about education uh, at the corporate level as well as kindergarten through 12th grade and, 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 and all through college. And what I discovered in my own professional work is Video games have made the greatest influence or impact on the next generation when it comes to learning. And a lot of people don't even know this. Wow. So I knew what I wanted to talk about. I also knew that there were three major influences that have changed the brain chemistry and the behavior and the expectations of these next generations. I'm the only person who kind of put it together. And I sat back and I said, okay, here's what I want to talk about. And it was never good enough. It's like Occam's razor. You have to trim the fat when you do a TED Talk. You must trim everything away. And what do you really want to talk about? And I like to joke around on stage and I like to do impersonations, all this. I had to get rid of all of that and really just go for what is the most impactful thing I can say in the moment right now to let everybody know what I really am passionate about. So there's that aspect. So that's the stress part. And even up on the day before, the rehearsal the day before, that's not what I did when I did it live. I had changed it up until the last minute because I didn't feel the stories had that um, je ne sais quoi, that, that passion, that power, that boom that was going to hit because I really wanted people to understand where I'm coming from. Um, but then on the other hand, the TED people are so incredibly supportive. Uh, they assigned me a, a, a speaker coach and as soon as she met me she's really a, a sweetheart she just said oh I can't coach you on the speaking but I'll, I'll give you pointers on this this and this and she was so concise about exactly where I need the most help which was it was just powerful and then when you get there and the people in the rehearsal and helping you and being supportive of what your ideas are and they as a group they all coach you through and then the other side of this is I felt so incredibly honored to be on stage with some of the, the best speakers uh, I've ever been blessed uh, to, to grace the stage with. You know, we had uh, Chris Desi up there. He was talking about um, doing something big and impactful because his father had ALS. Uh, Daniel Newman was talking about, you know, how do we have relationships in the age of emoji? You know, he had a, a baby boy and he's texting people and sending out emojis on, on social media and his whole family is standing right there. How do we handle things like that? Uh, you know, it was just uh, probably one of the most profound uh, moments I've ever had. It really was. Uh, Rena DeLacy was there. She talked about compassionate management because she also works with uh, millennials. Uh, Kimberly, uh, I forget her last name, uh, Kimberly was there uh, giving a speech and, and she was the only amateur amongst us and she was just nervous and really? we all were so supportive and we helped her. So you get professionals and amateurs getting on the stage and you just go, oh my goodness, this is like, it's just powerful to watch. It, it really touches your heart because everybody's coming from very different disciplines. So it, it, it I wasn't nervous to be around them. I wanted to see the power that they were bringing to the stage because these are tender, authentic stories. I Kimberly Davis, yes. yes. 
Uh, she was just uh, Kimberly Marcus, actually. Kimberly Marcus gave this amazing talk where um, when in rehearsal, we were all trying to support each other. This is the most powerful, loving, nurturing thing you can get from the TED Talks. But Kimberly Marcus is not a professional speaker. She's an artist. She's a mother. She's, she's very uh, impactful in the work that she does. And when she got up on stage, she's telling us this story and weaving it. And at the end, she had this amazing poem that she had written. And we're like, no, 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 no. You've got to open with that. You have to open with that. And she did. She got huge laughs. And the impact was just different. Everybody was helping each other at oh, the TED event. That. It's just phenomenal. And uh, I was first up, so I had the, I had the sweet you spot. Yeah. <laughs> so you set the bar high. Everybody, I would not want to follow you. Uh, you know, it was interesting. Uh, uh, in rehearsal, everybody got moved around and they just said, we're going to start with Brad. So that, yeah, it was... You may say it would be hard to follow me, but the reality is I set the tone too. So I have a lot of pressure to, to bring my A game, which is really phenomenal. Um, and also the TED Talk kind of changes your life a little bit because as soon as you say to people, well, you can see my TED Talk online, uh, TEDx Terrytown, uh, all of a sudden they go, you did a TED Talk? You know, and it's like, it does. It really changes things. And it, I believe it, it's a part of my work that people don't usually get a chance to see in me, which is a more tender, nurturing ideology of learning about the generations mm -hmm. uh, that you wouldn't normally see me do in a corporate event. Right. So Brad, why do you think millennials are stereotyped and judged? Boomers are still looking at them through the lens of the boomer experience, which is, you know, I gotta get up at 5.30, I gotta fear my boss. My boss is not my peer, he's somebody I have to, you know, be scared around, and then hustle, hustle, hustle. That's that work ethic. Well, we've all been taught to fear our boss. And how many boomers, you know, who might be watching this, we may have even had mean bosses when we were kids. I had a boss hit me once. Wow. And I was wrong, so I obviously can't <laughs> go after him. But uh, we were taught to look busy when the boss was walking by our desk. I remember that. Yeah, you remember <laughs> So uh, if you really wanted to get ahead, uh, you would show up before the boss arrived and you left after, after. the boss left. So everybody goes, that guy's working hard. And then you find out that guy hasn't been doing anything. He just knew how to get in early and right. leave late. Well, now you have a generation that hasn't been raised that way. They've been taught to work at their own pace, to collaborate, to get things done, to re you know, rely on their team. And they've never been taught to fear their boss. As a matter of fact, their parents were their peers, their mentors growing up. So they were always capable of going to mom and dad to talk about just about anything. Mm -hmm. So they went into the school system after that. And then they could call their teacher by her first name. Hey, Becky, I don't really want to do math today. I'd like to do art. You know? <laughs> so they could cherry pick their curriculum. Wow. And so by the time they entered the workforce, they could go up to the CEO and say, Hey, Chet, I'm going to show you how to run this place because I got my MBA. They're fearless when it, they don't see the hierarchy, the structure, or that they should fear their boss in any way, shape, or form. They see themselves as equal to that person who has 35 years of experience Interesting. in the workforce. Interesting. So this is why a lot of times boomers will look at a millennial and say, he's arrogant or she's arrogant and who does she think she is? Well, she or he thinks they're doing their very best job by coming up to you and treating you like an equal. Whereas inside the boomer's head, anybody who's five years younger than them is a kid. You know, we, we still have that in our vocabulary. It's like, oh, he's a kid. I have a friend of mine. I'm in my 50s, and I have a friend of mine. She's only four or five years older than me. She's like, oh, my precious little boy, Brad. You know, and I'm like, I am this, almost the same age as you. Get that out of your head, out of your vocabulary, because that's what's helping you not see millennials in the light they should. And you're seeing this um, trend right now. The companies are now going after the Generation Z, mm -hmm. or the generation I like to call the cloud generation. Uh, because they don't even know that there's a structure in place. The boomers, we collected our books and our albums, and then the next generation, they have everything on an iPod. This generation doesn't even have those things. It's in the cloud. Well, the reason everybody's focusing on Generation Z 
is they still haven't figured out millennials and millennials buying patterns are still not like boomers or any other generation. They can't track them. Right, they cannot track them because imagine this for a moment, ever since you've been a child, from baby to six years of age, you've been bombarded on television with 20,000 brands. And every one of those brands has a cartoon connected to it, a toy connected to it, uh, food connected to it, all these things. They ignore marketing because it's just been bombarded into their psyche for so long, they ignore it. And marketers still don't get it. They're still pounding everybody with buy me, buy this, buy that, do this, do that. That brings up a really interesting point, Brad. Um, the millennials are gonna be the next the next consumer by the yes. end of 2017. So doesn't it make sense for employers to hire them? Yes. I've always told people this, instead of trying to figure out millennials, I mean, they hire me uh, and I have context. You know, I don't judge it. I'm a, I'm a baby boomer, but I can see why millennials act the way they do, why Generation X acts the way they do, and why boomers act the way they do. And that is what I study, the influences on generational behavior and buying patterns that influence corporations. So what happens is they're ignoring millennials and Generation Z and just going in and judging that all the data based on old paradigms. And the reality is, is look, this is a generation that doesn't buy something just because you gave your blessing to it from on high. You know, that the old marketing attitude is, you know, our products are great. Well, when the internet came along, all of a sudden there was this conversation that has always been there, but they never were able to track it, see it, or even know it existed. And now everybody's complaining about your product. And they're like, no, 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 no. I, I, I. All of a sudden websites started to lose the address, the 1-800 number, all this, because they don't want to deal with it. The best companies today are creating a one-to-one -one relationship that's a two-way relationship with their customer and treating them like adults. Love Instead that. of having this, this marketing message from on high, buy our products. I don't want to buy your products. <laughs> well, well, why not? That's the first question any corporation should be asking. Why don't you want to buy our products? Because of this, this, and this. We're going to change. I think you're going to like what we're doing. We're going to do big things just for you because we respect you. Wow. So, Brad, tell us about your book. Liquid Leadership. Yes. Ta-da! This is a, and I, I brought you a copy. Oh, That's for you. thank you so much. Liquid leadership. It's vi it's a very funny story. I said to my wife, um, you know, in my second act, I said, "What should I do?" She goes, "You should write a book about your experience during the dot com era of getting your company to grow four hundred twenty five percent for five straight years by inspiring a younger workforce." digital native workforce. So I was able to grow my company without any capital. No one gave us any money. Uh, we bootstrapped the whole operation until we went public. So in 18 months, uh, we went from just two guys in an office to 60 employees in offices worldwide. How did I do that? Well, I motivated the, my workforce culture to just be passionate about uh, creating new products, new divisions, new paradigms, new uh, software and things like that at a time when we were just beginning with the internet. It was like the Wild West back then and I talk a lot about that in there and how companies can work today to take their company to another level. It's about reinvention and understanding what's going on and you don't have to struggle so hard doing it as long as you start listening to the next generation because that's where the seeds are, the, the, the new ideas, the reinvention. And I believe I am the only author who answers why these next generations act the way they do, behave the way they do, and they have different expectations. I mean, let's face it, they've changed the way we romance, the way we pay, the way we interact, and the way we play. That's what this generation has done, and it's all through technology. I mean, ask yourself this. They're disruptors. Yes. If you're watching right now, I've met grandparents who are texting and I go, wait a minute, you're not supposed to be doing that. Right? I, go, I have to if I want to talk to my grandkids. Right. And their grandkids are in their 30s. Wow. That's amazing. Yes. So we that's what's happened. We have adopted and adapted to this 
all new technology because the next generation is leading the way. Love that. Well, you're going to have to get Brad's book um, from Woodstock to Wikipedia. I love yes, that. So, liquid, yeah. liquid leadership. And for more information, go to smartthumb.com. Thanks, Thank Brad. You so much.